Hi, everyone out there. Steve here with a special announcement for you from Richard Lim, host of the podcast, This American President. Richard is a fellow member of the Parthenon Podcast Network. November 22nd marked the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. To commemorate this pivotal event in American history, learn more about Kennedy's 1963 Texas visit and re-election campaign, his assassination and legacy, you can listen to this excerpt from This American President. This American President is a fantastic podcast, and I highly recommend you follow the links in the show notes to listen to the full episode and learn how to listen and subscribe. Thanks for joining me today, and I will talk to you next time. By the fall of 1963, Kennedy began focusing more on his upcoming re-election campaign. A few days after the South Vietnamese coup, the Republican governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller, announced that he was a candidate for the Republican nomination. Arizona Republican Senator Barry Goldwater had yet to announce, but he was widely expected to run. He and Kennedy were friends and old colleagues from the Senate. Some accounts indicate that the two looked forward to running against each other if Goldwater could get the nomination. Kennedy felt that it was going to be a tough race. He told his aides that he doubted whether he could make any inroads into the states he lost in 1960, saying, quote, Let's quit on Kansas and Nebraska. North Dakota? That's impossible. He added, quote, What is it we have to sell them? We hope to sell them prosperity. But for the average guy, prosperity is nil. He's not unprosperous, but he's not very prosperous. He's not going to make out well off, and the people who are well off hate our guts. Kennedy had also proposed a civil rights bill earlier that year. He feared that this would cost him politically in the South, saying, quote, We're the ones shoving the Negroes down his throat. Texas was key to his re-election hopes. He had carried the state in 1960 by just two percentage points, thanks in large part to having Lyndon Johnson as his running mate. The problem was that he was still unpopular in the state, and the Democratic Party was split between liberals and conservatives. He hoped that a trip to Texas, scheduled for November 21st and 22nd, would help mend some fences. He flew to Texas on the 21st with his wife, Jackie. Vice President Lyndon Johnson and his wife joined them as they swung through San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth. Kennedy gave speeches, got a tour of Brooks Air Force Base, and attended a dinner honoring Congressman Albert Thomas. While in Houston, JFK and his wife attended dinner for the League of United Latin American Citizens, where Jackie charmed the audience by speaking Spanish. An observer later commented on how beautiful the couple looked. They flew to Fort Worth and retired that night at a hotel. The next day, November 22nd, The presidential party attended breakfast at the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, where Kennedy spoke about the contribution Texas was making to America's national security. Then they took a short flight to Dallas, landing at Love Field at 11.38 a.m. The Kennedys and the Johnsons got into separate cars for a motorcade that would take them through the streets of Dallas and to the Dallas Trademark, where they would have lunch and where Kennedy would give a speech. Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife joined the Kennedys in their car. Since Kennedy was unpopular in Texas, there was concern that he might be given a hostile welcome by hecklers. There was also some concern that he might be in some sort of physical danger. Adlai Stevenson had visited Dallas a few weeks earlier and was confronted by an aggressive crowd that spat on him. One woman struck him with a placard. Just before the trip, Kennedy said, quote, were heading into nut country. But to the president's surprise, and to the surprise of his touring party, Dallas welcomed him and Jackie with open arms. Thousands of people filled the streets to see them, smiling and waving as the motorcade passed by. A wonderful welcome having been given to the president here in downtown Dallas. It was a it was quite a spectacle, one that Dallas won't see for a long time to come. And any fears that might have existed in the minds of some about the uh, the alleged small handful of people who might have launched severe demonstrations to bar the president's visit, these were 
Uh, finally, unjustified, or at least taken care of in uh, good order by the Dallas Police Department, who had such a tremendous force in evidence at the uh, downtown uh, areas and all over the city of Dallas as the motorcade moved through that there was uh, no danger whatsoever and none in evidence of adverse uh, reactions to the president's visit. A completely overwhelming welcome for the president. Now, this is Bob Huffaker in downtown Dallas. At around 12.30 p.m., near the end of the trip to the trademark, the motorcade approached Dealey Plaza. Noting the warm reception, Mrs. Connolly turned to Kennedy and said, quote, Mr. President, you can't say that Dallas doesn't love you. In his distinct Boston accent, he replied, quote, No, you certainly can't. Just moments later, a man aimed a rifle at Kennedy and pulled the trigger. The bullet ripped through the air and hit its mark. President Kennedy and Governor John B. Connolly of Texas had been cut down by an assassin's bullet as they toured downtown Dallas in an open automobile. The president, his limp body cradled in the arms of his wife, was rushed to Parkland Hospital. The governor also was taken to Parkland. What was a wonderful welcome in downtown Dallas has become a scene of indescribable horror as hundreds of people are crowd outside the back door of the emergency room here at Parkland Hospital. Faces are ashen white, and people are wondering, is our president going to live? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a press report over the wires. We hope that it is unconfirmed, but we have to doubt it. The president of the United States has been the victim of an assassination. We will play the funeral march from Beethoven's Third Symphony. Right now, I just don't know what to do. Was there much emotion among the congregation? There was, really. It was amazing to see the number of men who came into the cathedral sobbing, almost convulsed with sorrow, anguish. But all we can do now is pray for him and about all we can do. An entire loss to the world is hardly believable. No one wants to say anything on an occasion like this, but someone must have something to say. Mr. Wright, do you have something to say? We have just learned that our president is dead. This is a sad day, a day of grief, a day of shame for this land that anyone would hate, that anyone would seek to kill the president of the United States. We must strive anew to rebuild our faith and our hope May merciful God console his loved ones and his family. May that same God bless this land that from this moment of such deep grief, we may rebuild in faith and not in fear, and love and not in hate. I know the nation mourns and, and will deeply mourn. Those of us who were with him today when he was so alive, so buoyant, so outgoing, exposing himself to the public, will never forget this experience and will always remember him as the president who 
went to the people, not fearing to expose himself, his person, his safety, his own repose to his land and his people. I once watched a documentary on the Kennedy assassination produced in the UK, so it had a bit of an outside perspective on how the assassination shaped the United States. And one line stuck with me. The narrator said that Americans hadn't gotten over it. I felt that this was an astute observation. If you talk to anyone who was alive during the assassination and ask them about it, to this day, they usually convey the sense of shock and senselessness they felt when it happened. They usually can tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing when they found out that the president had been killed. And for many who were either too young to remember it or weren't born yet, the assassination remains an endlessly fascinating topic. Sometimes it's a bit of a macabre fascination. There are assassination buffs who've watched the footage of Kennedy being shot over and over again, trying to figure out just what happened that day. There are alleged autopsy photos of JFK that you can find in books or on a Google search, photos that are studied for evidence. Thousands of books, documentaries, and movies have been made telling us who killed Kennedy, whether it was, as the government said, Lee Harvey Oswald, or a broader conspiracy. There are questions that continue to perplex the American people. Why was Lee Harvey Oswald himself killed just two days after the assassination? Was there a second gunman on the grassy knoll? Kennedy died after serving as president for two years, ten months, and two days. He was 46 years old, the shortest lifespan for any American president. His death cut short a presidency that was still in the making, with many goals and initiatives left undone. It would fall upon his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, to see these goals accomplished. The trauma and unique circumstances of Kennedy's assassination would leave a deep imprint on the psyche of the American people. They remember Kennedy's thick Boston accent and his soaring eloquence. They remember his charisma and the glamour surrounding him and his family. They recall images of him and his beautiful wife and him playing with his young children. But they also remember the darker side of the Kennedy years. They hear about the accusations against him and his family that his father was a bootlegger, and that he stole the 1960 election. They remember the affairs. They picture Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday to him on national television. They see books being published by women, even over half a century after his death, that reveal yet another one of Kennedy's extramarital affairs. They remember the scandals that rocked his family even after his death, that his brother Teddy drove his car off a road in Chappaquiddick. And while Teddy managed to get out of the car, left a young woman to drown. They remember the haunting images of JFK in Dallas, with Jackie next to him in her pink suit, shaking hands with the crowds and riding in the motorcade. They've seen the footage of him getting shot. They remember the image of little John John saluting his father's casket. These images, perhaps, are the biggest imprint Kennedy left in the collective memory of the American people. They are, perhaps more vivid than anything Americans remember about other presidents, like Dwight Eisenhower, and even more recent ones like George H.W. Bush. Kennedy was one of the most popular presidents of all time. He still holds the highest approval average in Gallup polling, at 70%. Compare that to Ronald Reagan's average, at 53%, and Bill Clinton's at 55%, both two-term presidents. And that popularity has lasted. When Gallup polled a sample of Americans in 2010 on their feelings towards recent presidents, Kennedy rated the highest with an 85% approval rating. Reagan came in second with 74%, while Kennedy's 1960 opponent, Richard Nixon, polled lowest at 29%. But you have to wonder how much of his popularity comes from what Kennedy actually did versus what he represented and what feelings he evoked in the American people. Part of it might have to do with the way history turned out after his death. His successor, Lyndon Johnson, achieved much of Kennedy's domestic goals, passing a tax cut 
and civil rights legislation, but he also escalated American involvement in Vietnam. The result was a stalemate, with tens of thousands of Americans dead, dividing Americans across the country. Soon, assassinations took the lives of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy. Then Richard Nixon took office, who, despite his foreign policy successes, saw his presidency crumble due to Watergate. Both the war and Watergate would deeply erode the American people's trust in their government institutions and their leaders. The traumas of the 1960s and 70s, the upheavals, the assassinations, the scandals, all of these things led Americans to look back at what happened before with a sense of nostalgia. They remembered the days when Kennedy was in the White House. His assassination seemed to mark a turning point from an era of optimism to one of chaos and confusion. Kennedy obviously didn't have a chance to complete the things he started. The high hopes he inspired in 1960 were left unfulfilled. Whether he would have fulfilled them is a question that historians continue to debate. Kennedy's assassination robbed him of the chance to realize his vision, but it also shielded him from the possibility of failure and disappointment. There are many examples of leaders coming into office with great aspirations, but who leave office with a sense of unfulfilled promise, a sense that the hype didn't match the reality. Had Kennedy lived, would that have been the case? And if so, is his legacy actually enhanced by his violent death? On the evening of November 22, 1963, just hours after President Kennedy died, David Brinkley summed up that extraordinary and tragic day. It has all been shocking, but perhaps one element in the shock was the speed. By the Washington clock, at a little after one o'clock this afternoon, President Kennedy was about as li alive as any human being ever gets. Young, strong, vigorous, looking forward to, no doubt, five more years, he hoped, of leadership in this country and of the Western world. His wife, young, beautiful, looking very happy, was beside him and seeming to be having a wonderful time and leaning across the back seat of the car to say to him, you can't say Dallas hasn't been friendly to you. That was a little after one o'clock. Five hours later, at six o'clock, Mr. Kennedy had been murdered. Lyndon Johnson was president of the United States. Mrs. Kennedy was a widow, brave and composed one that nobody could fail to admire. All of them were back in Washington, returning in the same airplane that took them to Texas to an incredible tragedy. The sheer speed of it was just too fast for the senses. In about four hours, we had gone from President Kennedy in Dallas alive to back in Washington dead and a new president in his place. There is no more news here tonight and really no more to say except that what has happened today has been just too much, too ugly, and too fast. To learn more about John F. Kennedy, check out The Presidency of John F. Kennedy by James Giglio, President Kennedy, Profile of Power by Richard Reeves, and Strategies of Containment by John Lewis Gaddis. This American President is produced by myself, Richard Lim, and Michael Neal. Special thanks to Jennifer Mazella for her contributions in producing this episode. If you like what you've been hearing, you can help us by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our show. I'm Richard Lim. We're back next time with more This American President.